Hello, we're just going to wait a couple more seconds to let the people in from the waiting room um, and then I will welcome you. So hello and good evening. Welcome to this session, which forms part of Getting On Board's Trustee Learning Programme. My name is Fiona McCausland and today we are talking about recruiting, using and keeping trustees with financial skills. Where are all the financial trustees? And before I hand over to Penny Wilson, who is um, both our panel chair for the evening and Getting On Board CEO, I'll just cover some housekeeping. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat and tell us why you've come today. This session will be recorded. Um, you will get access to the recording and any slides used following the session and recordings may be added to YouTube. Um, please do stay muted on the call unless asked on mute. It helps to make sure everyone can hear who is talking clearly. Um, there are closed captions available. You need to enable these at your end. And please use the chat to ask questions and share your experiences. We really do love to hear from you. We have trustees coming from all over the country. So it's fantastic to, uh, to, to sort of see you speak to us. Um, and please keep your comments respectful and useful. And um, finally, thank you to our sponsors, Charisma, Diversity, Diversifying Group, Perido, Starfish and TPP for supporting the Trustee Learning Programme. It's their support which allows us to make this session and the whole programme free to attend. And I'll now hand over to Penny, who is chairing. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so welcome, everybody. We're talking about where are all the finance trustees. Um, and this event is brought to you by Getting On Board and also by Charterpath. And if you're not aware of Charterpath's work, do Google them right now and, and go back and look at their website afterwards. You'll be hearing a bit about them because we've got Alex and Alice from Charterpath with us this evening. Um, so we're here to discuss where are all the finance trustees. This is a really important topic. I'm going to come to Alex in a minute to tell us why, but it's a real pain point for charities, how to recruit a treasurer, how to keep a treasurer. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. So we're going to be talking a bit about what's in a name. You know, is the very name a huge barrier to recruiting treasurers and honorary treasurers and all these other kind of weirdy beardy names? We're going to talk about how charities can use volunteers with financial skills, both as trustees, but also more broadly. We're going to, of course, talk about how and where to recruit trustees with financial skills. And we're going to talk about how to keep your finance trustees happy, because it's all very well recruiting them. But actually, if we can't keep them or if they're not doing what we expected them to do, then actually we've failed, haven't we? So that's what we're going to cover. As Fiona said, please feel absolutely free to make comments in the chat. Do ask questions. We will be coming to the chat for questions. We'd love to hear from you. So um, before I ask the rest of the panel to introduce themselves, Alex, can we come to you and can you tell us, give us a bit of context, please, on this topic? Sure. So my name's Alex. I'm one of the co-founders of Charter Path. Um, as Penny touched on, um, our mission is to actually connect uh, charities and non-profits with uh, volunteers who have financial skills. So Alice, uh, my other co-founder, who's on this uh, webinar too, um, we're both trained as accountants. Um, we've both volunteered throughout our professional careers and it was actually uh, when Alice was uh, volunteering as a charity trustee, myself as a school governor, um, during the pandemic, we saw the real financial challenges specifically that charities and nonprofits were facing. Increased demand for services at the same time as struggling to secure funding, donations down, grants proving increasingly challenging to uh, win. So seeing that, we saw actually the, the, the access to free uh, skills through uh, volunteer finance professionals um, can really help charities at this difficult time. And so we started Charter Path. Our mission is to increase the proportion of finance professionals that volunteer from the current levels, which is around 10%, uh, looking to get that to 50%. So it's really a part of you know, their professional careers and hence can give back their skills to the nonprofit sector. So uh, we do recognize the challenge for charities to, to access volunteer financial skills. It's been, um, you know, something we're working on from all directions, both to inspire more people, more finance professionals to volunteer, but also to build more connections between charities and finance professionals. So a chance to dig into some of those areas as part of the session today. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, so I'd love the other panellists to introduce yourselves, but I'm going to wrap that into the first question so that you keep your intros nice and snappy because we're going to be hearing from you for the next hour. So we'll know, know all about you by the end. Um, so let's start with our first area, which is which is about the name. What you know, what's in a name? What should we be recruiting something called treasurer at all? Kemi, can we come to you and, and please introduce yourself first? everybody. My name is Kemi. I'm currently working as a senior finance business partner at a health 
um, innovation organization. Also have the pleasure of working with Alice and Alex of Charter Path. So really sort of keen to support them. And I've been a trustee and treasurer in the past. There is definitely a lot in the name. I think from a finance perspective, we don't necessarily hear the word treasurer or trustee too much. In the not-for-profit world, you might see on the website, meet our trustees, and there are a bunch of people that you ironically never see or meet. So I think already from a visual standpoint, you actually don't actually know who these people are, let alone what they do. And I think it just adds to the kind of myth in terms of what a trustee actually is. So I definitely think the name is important and it's quite similar to, I think in a sort of current world, like if you've got a job title and it's almost meaningless, the recruiter might say, well, actually tell me what you do and use that as your job title because there's no point having something that doesn't necessarily translate to the outside world. So there's definitely a lot in the name and that's something that we, a hurdle that needs to be navigated. Thank you. Alice, what would you add to that? Uh, thanks, Penny. Uh, Alice, a chartered accountant, trustee, school governor and uh, co-founder of Charter Path. The thing I would add, I suppose, from a volunteer perspective, so finance professional, is that uh, to Kemi's point, we just don't know what a treasurer is or an honorary treasurer. And it's just an added hurdle when you're thinking about getting involved, because the first thing you've got to do is kind of Google it and understand what is it. And what we all know from working in the non-profit sector and the same does go to be fair in the for-profit is it doesn't really mean anything because you can be very hands-on as a treasurer or you can be very much oversight so there's no actual way of finding out what these titles mean anyway until you've actually seen a role description so the more we can simplify it and make it accessible to people whether it's just sort of you know a finance volunteer or just something that removes that mystique around it it's one less barrier for uh, finance volunteers to have to or finance professionals to have to navigate. Thank you Alice and I wonder if you could just say something more about the range of things that that treasurer or finance trustee might cover and how that varies so enormously from one organisation to the next. Yeah absolutely so one thing Alex and I do when we're trying to talk to finance professionals and explain these roles is we have um, a sort of slide which has got a whole list of finance tasks on it and that goes from things like bookkeeping and preparing the accounts to reviewing the accounts that goes from making transactions to managing relationships with the bank to looking at processes and controls developing the risk register you know the, the range of skills that finance professionals get through their training is so broad and the one thing I would add to that is that the individuals even when they're very junior and you're starting off your career you do learn of the technical things up front so what I mean um, by that to say is that these the, the skills range enormously and what you can be doing in those uh, as a trustee or as a treasurer uh, really varies. So depending on the size of the charity, you might be doing the accounts, you might be reviewing the accounts and, and finance professionals are capable of doing all of those things, but they just need to understand what exactly is involved and how long the time requirements would be for each. Brilliant. Thank you. And I see that we've in the chat that we've got some treasurers here today and we've also got people desperately seeking treasurers. <laughs> <laughs> so people who are attending, please feel free to add any comments as well as questions in the chat uh, based on your own experiences. Marie, can I come to you? So you're from Perida, a recruitment agency, and obviously you're recruiting lots of treasurers. What do you see in terms of the names that people use? And I guess the clarity that charities do or don't have about what they actually need. Yeah, hi. Um, good to be here, Penny, and good to be with the other panellists and all of you that have turned up. Nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, I'm from Paradise. So we recruit um, board roles. And I would say, I mean, we recruit probably about 300 board members a year. And I'd, I'd say at least half of them are finance roles. Um, I think the last, I was thinking about the last six um, board roles I've recruited and they've all involved finance trustees. And quite often, now people are talking about them being like finance trustees, like Alice was saying that the word treasurer hasn't been in the last the last six I've recruited anyway, and and generally, even wider than that, sometimes it's kind of strategic, you know, the strategic audit and finance that they, that these roles are needed for. So I know sometimes treasurer is still used, but also is being broadened. And I think finance is is simpler, um, and and we tend to. Um, you know, really try and understand from the organisation what they need from that role and then um, be very kind of clear and transparent about that and how we describe the job description and in how we seek for the, the person. That really helps. 
And Marie, do you think that such a, are such a large percentage of the roles that you recruit for, are they finance because it's, is it inherently harder or are chari charities find it harder? And is that connected with the language and the lack of clarity? Am I, am I making too many conclusions? Am I putting words to your <laughs> I mouth? I wonder, I mean, I wonder if, um, I mean, I think since COVID and a lot of organisations building back, there is probably a lot more reforecasting and a bigger job to do in terms of the finances of different organisations. And so I, I wonder, in, in a lot of the roles we do, they aren't the only finance person on the board. And so I think maybe organisations are thinking about having more than one person with financial skills on their board, which is really good because actually the finance trustee isn't just a finance trustee are they a board member they're also a person with a whole holistic range of skills but also the rest of the board are, are responsible for the finances too and so sharing the skills across the board is a really good idea brilliant and actually I'd love to come to that so you know what would any of the panelists like to take the questions what are the risks of having a sole finance trustee who might want to say something about that yeah, I'll stop there. I mean, I've been in that exact position myself a couple of times, so I can definitely relate to that. And look, there's there's challenges that that brings for the individual who's a volunteer. And obviously it brings challenges for the for the charity or, or the school or the nonprofit that's using them. I think from an individual perspective, though, that in that, that situation, it can feel like quite a lonely role. And I, it plays that language point too, where having been badged as the treasurer, so you've got sort of I almost felt different to the rest of the group. The rest were trustees and I was the treasurer and I sort of, and, and everything was delegated or, you know, went across to the treasurer. And that can feel quite, you can feel quite lonely. You can feel isolated. Um, you know, completely agree with Mary's point about, you know, the need for that to be a collective responsibility across the whole group. So I think that doesn't help in terms of particularly, you'll come on to it, but that retaining, um, you know, uh, volunteers with financial skills, I think that can be a challenge. But I think also having from a, um, the charity side, I think the, the best time, you know, situations I've been in is where there were a number of people with the skill. So you had different perspectives. I might have, a, you know, on many topics, you'll be having great debates and discussions amongst trustees. And you can often get to the, the finance area and it becomes quite one way traffic. Just the treasurer talking out the group and that can limit the challenge um, and sort of um, the decision making ultimately. So I think there are many, many reasons why I'm really supportive of that, of um, having multiple volunteers with those skills for the individual and for the organization. I love that one way traffic point. I think it's so true. And I'm just going to plug a monthly free webinar from Getting On Board, which is a webinar we have called In To Infinity and Beyond. And it is finance for non-finance trustees. Specifically, if you've got no finance background and you're a trustee or you have trustees that you would like to be better at the numbers, do send them to that webinar. It's actually one of our most popular. We get about 100 signups a month for that from trustees just thinking, I, you know, I should know more about about being able to um, look at the numbers. So I'm just gonna ask our panel to kind of pin their names here, to pick a side. Would you all, would you use the word treasurer in trustee recruitment? And Marie, you're, you're, obviously that depends a bit on what your clients want, but you know, would you, <laughs> would you say to charities, just dump the word treasurer or is it more kind of, is, is it not so clear cut? Alice, what do you think? Yeah, dump it. Dump I it, think, sadly, okay. yeah. Kemi, what's it's your thought? For me. Great, definitely done it. It's had a nice, nice track record, but yeah, if you love things enough, you've got to let them go sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Marie, don't pocky. Uh, I, I think be be more accurate if you can with it with the you know, and also less intimidating. So finance. Yes. Is the least. Thank you, Alex. Dump. I uh, look, I'm in the dump camp, and it it goes back to there's an interesting one here about diversity as well. In mm. that you know, there's it's relatively stereotyped, but there are gender splits between particularly you'll see you know men will typically apply for roles where they feel like they have sort of 60 percent of the attributes six, you know typically for women that's much higher sort of 90 95 percent of the attributes so i think both the job title and the job descriptions can act as barriers to diversity so i think anything that can reduce that i would encourage so i go dump great well that was pretty unanimous wasn't it <laughs> um let's move on to how trust how charities can get clear about what they actually need or how they might talk about not being clear about what they need if actually they, they're not clear because they haven't got any finance people to call upon. How can they get clear? And actually, before I throw that question to you, and Kemi, I'll come to you first on that. I just want to come back to Laura's comment in the chat. Hello, Laura. Laura says um, 
they're 100 percent volunteer led and therefore their trustees are probably more hands on than usual. Actually, Laura, you are more usual than trustees with staff. There are many more trustees with no staff to call on at all than, re than the reverse. And panel will really try to keep that in mind when we're talking about what we need from our treasurers, won't we? Because actually some trustees have finance staff or people who are doing some finance stuff, and some really don't, it's just them. And that kind of shows the diversity of, of what the, the finance trustee might be getting up to in terms of their role. So, Kemi, what are your thoughts on how trustees can get clear on what they might need from a finance trustee or finance trustees multiple? Yeah, it's a good point. I think one of the aspects that charities need to focus on, and it sounds obvious, but recognise where the gaps are, and it could be, for example, looking at previous meetings or having a review over the past six months and trying to identify where they've struggled on a particular agenda item, what has been the struggle. So has it? they may have said we need a finance person, but it's about drilling down a bit more that working on that spreadsheet took a lot longer because somebody didn't have those Excel skills. I was doing a fundraising application and I just needed somebody to review it. So trying to narrow those down. And I think it's something we might come to people who are trained as accountants or even if they're not qualified, they've worked in a profession. There's a stereotype that we only deal with numbers. You know, we go out for a meal and it's time to split the bill and the receipt comes to the person who works in finance. But actually, in order to become qualified or even be qualified by experience, you need to have a high level of communication skills, interpersonal skills, written skills. There's such a range. And to Laura's point as well, even in large charities, all members of the organisation, including finance team, they can get involved in fundraising because a lot of times you join a not-for-profit not because you want to make a difference. But beyond that, you actually want to understand what the charity does and how you can support. So by default, you end up working with a lot of different colleagues and understanding what they do and therefore how you can use their skills to support them. I've certainly in the past, both as a trustee treasurer and working in a charity, I've worked on bids and that's not just been the numbers at the end. It's actually been reading through. It's been peer reviewing. It's been having that second look because you can't always mark your own homework. So there is such a wide range if people just spend that time to try and think about what is it actually need. And then that can then translate into a much more enhanced job description. Great, thank you. And Nick, I've clocked your question. What a brilliant question, coming straight onto that after we've tackled this one. Um, so Marie, you you started to talk about how you might help your clients with trying to kind of pull out what, what, what it is they need from their finance trustee. How does that conversation go? How do you help organisations think that through? Yeah, I mean, building on what Kemi was just saying there as well, I think it's about telling the story of the whole organisation and then the role of finance within that. And, and that's about the strategy, isn't it? But it's also about income generation and the type of um, kind of vision and mission that the organisation's got and attracting um, people with financial skills, but based on being part of the whole, as we said earlier. Um, and I think it really varies, doesn't it? I mean, some, you know, some organisations we recruit um, finance folk for are on a journey because say the organization's going from being an NHS foundation to setting up its own charitable trust you know we've had a situation like that there's grant giving organizations which are completely different from um you know trading organizations that need somebody who can help them get income from statutory bodies there's voluntary income there's so there's such a range in terms of whether first of all whether what the organization's trying to do where they need to get the money from what kind of state they're in and then size that we've talked about as well so how hands-on you need to be so it's getting a real I guess I guess it's drilling down into the detail but then telling a top level story that's attractive and that makes that person think I'm a match for that not just because of my financial skills but because I'm interested in that cause and I'm interested in being part of that story and that's really yeah that's really key we're going to come on to that um Alice I'm going to come to you and just um there's a comment in the chat about, you know, if there are paid employees working on finances as well. So how how, do char how should charities work out what they actually need? And especially if there's paid employees already with, with finance responsibilities. Yeah, absolutely. And I really support what Kemi said, which is about, you know, thinking around the gaps and having a look at um, where you are missing sort of information or, or skill set. I think focused on having if you've got employees already in the charity with finance skills I mean they'd be the first people presumably to ask about where they might like additional support and oversight I mean something that um, we're looking at developing for Charter Path is a sort of checklist essentially of the huge range of skills that 
finance professionals have and can do so that it would enable a charity to go through and to think, um, right, I need help with my pay work role or my reconciliations or my risk register or my processes and controls. And again, it just helps with um, the sort of reflection of am I doing these things well or not? And link to that potentially a sort of self-assessment. So to Kemi's point, again, just having a think through what do we do well? What are we comfortable with? What have we looked at? And one thing I would recommend is that for charities, they shouldn't be afraid to potentially advertise a volunteer opportunity for someone with finance skills to come in and do an assessment about mm. where the kind of gaps are. So somebody is a sort of five years, let's say, oh, I'm making that up, but with a decent level of experience in the um, as in sort of financial skills. Um, I know next question, I've seen it in the chat, what our finance skills <laughs> will come on to. But um, you know, they would be able to take that kind of broad overview and look at people, look at processes, look at technical advice mm. and do a bit of an assessment, which you could then use to drill down into those different areas and plug the gaps. And, and just briefly, Penny, just to add on that one, I think that is one of the, the challenges. And I think, it's, again, it's a two way street between the volunteer and the, and the charity. But often working in the, with the nonprofit sector, they might have a, a view as to what the, that volunteer can do. And it will often start with the things that you can kind of relate to each year, like we have to prepare and submit a set of accounts every year. And so, you know, it often is sort of the genesis of it is there and, and the bookkeeper related to it. But often there are, there's a multitude of other tasks that they might not even know that that volunteer could help with if they had access to that skill set. And I think that's exactly to Alice's point where it could just be a one-off, almost like we talk about it, almost like try before you buy, where you say, look, we just need someone to come in and support us just for half a day to come in, be a sounding board, talk this through, see what we do. And it could be, you know, I had a similar experience with a really small charity that I've been a trustee for for a while now. And, you know, it's led to many other things, revamping the entire management pack, basically all the KPIs and metrics that they use to assess the effectiveness and look at the impact of the charity. And then to Marie's point, that then helps them better sell the, the benefits they bring and secure funding. So I think often what could start from just preparing a set of accounts, there's a lot of potential out there. And to Alice's point, I think if you can almost have like a checklist of, of tasks. And I that think it makes really it easier. Useful, you say, I want that, I want that. Actually, we don't need that, that and that. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's talk about the, I guess, the lines between when it's good to have a finance trustee and when it might be good to have as well or instead other sorts of help, whether that's other sorts of volunteers or um, pro bono help or paid help or in-house or et cetera, et cetera. Like where, where do we find, and, and part of this is based on resources, isn't it? So if we're a tiny organization with no cash, some of those options might not be to open to us, but many of them are. So where, who might want to take that question about where we work out, what who might help with what? Alice, do you want to come to yeah, that? Yeah, I'm happy to give a start. I suppose um, the one thing I was just immediately thinking of is the importance of chunking things down so that they become manageable mm -hmm. because the sort of where do we start question often it's Alex's point people say we need a treasurer don't exactly know what they do but they deal with all things finance they're going to have to have loads of experience and that's the sort of starting point whereas actually if you go through and think about what you need you can separate them into sort of smaller more manageable tasks which then it becomes much more accessible for um, a volunteer or multiple volunteers to do so for example, you might otherwise think you need to have a sort of paid resource, let's say, to manage all elements of finance. But if it can be split into different areas, it could potentially still be run by uh, volunteers. And I feel like that's a sort of a, a sort of the starting point is just to really understand what you need and whether it can be broken down. Because a big barrier for finance professionals is that the scale of what they're being asked to do sometimes can feel daunting, and it's hard to put an exact figure on it but we find it very hard to recruit volunteers for anything more than a couple of hours of work a week. So as soon as you're looking for somebody of more than two or three hours a week, probably you're looking at for a paid person because it's just incredibly hard to find volunteers with that kind of capacity and that reliability who won't have um, you know, different time commitments and, and be able to support. So I think if it's Big first question, can you chunk it down and split it up? And if not, if it's more than a couple of hours a week, I think you want to look for some kind of employed support. And then I think there's another element on the kind of employed bit is also thinking about kind of the level of technical support and advice you might need and the sort of insurances and things in place to make sure that you're getting the right level of input. And so if you're trying to make a kind of complicated finance decision, 
that will be relied on for many years to come you know just think about the pressure that you might be putting on that volunteer to get their support and instead look to, to use a volunteer potentially as a sounding board but if if there's lots of weight on it then think about you know obtaining some pro bono support in that situation and I guess there are brilliant uh, organisations like Community Accounting Plus. That's a social enterprise that Getting On Board itself uses where you can buy little bits of bookkeeping help. It's at, and it cheap as chips and high quality. Amazing. So there are yes. lots of, of organisations. Bloom is another good one. What was the other one? Alice? Bloom. B-L-U-M-E. Yeah. So perhaps we can post some of these in the chat. And if yes, people I will know do that. Those, please post away. Um, so any of the other panels want to come, want to answer this question before I move on? I think the only extra part I would add is I think don't underestimate the value of trying to pull together a job description that does capture your organization to Marie's point I think tell the story within that one thing we've been seeing recently which I think is a really cool way to do this is that no one wants to read like a two-page document a thousand you know tons of narrative bullet by bullet I've actually seen some really nice video job descriptions that organizations have used where they're talking about their organization but also you know bring to life the responsibilities of that role i think to alice's point chunking up the role and the responsibilities is really important so again one, you know one of the top reasons why you know so when you look at one in ten professionals with finance skills volunteer when you look at the top reason why they don't so five in ten it's due to um time commitments and we spend a lot of time talking to finance professionals saying you know come you can find time and I think there's a, lock, a lack of understanding about the typical time commitment. So if you look at the stats, the average time commitment for the trustee in the UK is around 30 hours in a year as a trustee. That's like sort of an estimated average and maybe optimistic, but estimated average. Um, the average for a UK subscriber to Netflix in the UK, the average viewing hours is over a thousand hours in a year, 1000. So, you know, we say to these people, well, look, you can find these 30 hours. Now, where does that start to break down? It's when you you then get volunteering you take on a role and you're suddenly realizing that they want sort of 30 hours a month for example and i think that's where starting to be realistic about you know where's the tipping point between a volunteer and then other resources that you need to look at and how can you start to break up some of those roles and responsibilities into different buckets between employed or pro bono and I, guess, and I guess there's something here isn't there about how we don't need to have all the answers before we go out to recruit a trustee okay. So actually, if we don't have any finance skills at our disposal, and that's why we're looking for a finance trustee or a volunteer, just to say, we're not sure what we need. We need, you know, yeah. come and help us, help yes. us work out. And actually, and I've learned this from wider trustee recruitment, talking about your challenges as an organisation and then seeking for people who, who want to help with those challenges yeah. rather than thinking, I've got to have all this finance expertise to even describe the problem. Yeah. Just actually, yeah. Just, just, that just, person will be part of that journey to help yeah. you define what you need. They'll, ha they'll be an input into that and help sort of clarify some of that. So yeah. I completely agree about taking that in steps. Yes. Right. We're going to move on a bit. Um, I want to come to Nick's question and I'm going to paraphrase Nick's question a bit by saying does a, tre a treasurer, well, let's treasurer, does our finance trustee, do they have to be an accountant and more than that do they have to be a charity accountant? Now I'm not going to come to all of you on this panelist because I expect you're going to totally agree mm -hmm. so who might, uh, Marie or Kemi, do you want to answer this one? Kemi, should we come to you as, <laughs> as an accountant? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there is a slight caveat here. I would say, yes, it's you need to be an accountant. It's better for the charity sort of risk profile to say that you've had any finance input from somebody who's qualified gives you a much better level of assurance, both internally and externally. I would say the caveat is, is that I've definitely worked with people throughout my career who have been qualified by exper experience, mm. but for various reasons, they've not had the finances or the resources or the time to actually um sort of qualify now back to Alex's point I'm sure they do watch Netflix but haven't had the time but it could have been a, a certain journey in their life they just haven't had that <laughs> ability to become qualified so that would be my only caveat but I think that goes back to some of the points made previously in terms of breaking down the chunks and what is it you need mm. so if you need somebody to sign off your accounts and you're a small charity or I saw in a chat sometimes funders do reject your applications if you don't have a finance trustee or treasurer and they might say or assume qualified so again you can break that down into what do I need this person for do I need somebody who's 
qualified to do this? Do I need somebody who has some finance skills to do this? Or do I need somebody who's worked in finance, but is happy to look at something of a non-finance nature because mm. being an accountant comes with having good interpersonal communication skills. So again, identifying those can sort of help in that sort of journey in terms of what you need. And it may be you need all three you may need a bit of one at one point in time and some the other it doesn't necessarily have to be a sort of one size fits all and you're kind of stuck with that decision it can that journey can change according to what you need what would what do you think marie um, I'm, yeah I'm i mean but... it's like kemi's answer you see so <laughs> i'm taking a litmus test as to whether the, the rest of the panel agree um i th i think um kemi's right in terms of if you're a tiny charity and it's your first time recruiting somebody with financial skills and you do have a job to be done from the task list that is about you know auditing and, uh, and then you probably do need that you know you do it would be for your own risk it would be uh, it'd be good to have somebody who is trained but i think if the person is somebody who's trained as you say by experience and also is maybe part of a wider subcommittee i don't want to get too carried away here because we're talking about somebody needing one person to start with but if if the person does come in and can be part of a subcommittee that's looking at risk and strategy then that's more attractive for the person and if some of the stuff is chunked down like alice said mm. so that some of the paid what you can find you know little bits of budget to do some of the paid time consuming stuff and that person can enjoy being part of the governance aspect of the role then i think um yeah then i think they don't necessarily if they're additional they don't necessarily to be need to be trained if they're additional to somebody who is trained and it depends on the role doesn't it it depends on the context the it board. really does doesn't it because yeah. you know i i and alice i'm going to come to you you're burning <laughs> yeah um, sorry scout, a, a trustee of a scout group where literally the job was to you know count the subs in and pay yeah. pence. you know you don't need to be a qualified accountant yeah. to be a treasurer of many many small organizations and alice perhaps you can say more about Kind of what Nick's hinting at, which is where else might finance trust finance skills be found that would be brilliant in a trustee where somebody isn't necessarily a qualified accountant? Yeah. OK, so uh, sorry, I was burning only because I think we all know that in an ideal world, and I say this as a trustee of a charity, too, when you're recruiting somebody with financial skills, ideally you want loads of experience, qualifications and some charity experience. But the problem is it's a catch 22 because everybody wants that. And so it's very hard to find these people. And then there's lots of young people we find coming through who are really keen to volunteer. They see it as a great way to learn, put their skills into practice. But essentially, people or organisations aren't really so interested in them because they don't have the experience. So they just can't find a role. So we feel really strongly that where possible, organisations think about that and build in potentially a junior role so that they might have somebody who's only part qualified, they're not sitting as a trustee, but they're there as a sort of support to the treasurer or the finance trustee um, so that they can learn on the job and then they can develop the experience with the support, as Marie said, from a kind of wider committee and other people that they can learn from. So it's about creating the opportunities. It's a win-win because you also build the succession planning in then as well, hopefully. And you're not stuck when your super experienced person decides to retire when they're 80 and they finally have to, to move on to something else. So I think that, that's sort of the, the bit I feel about whether they need to be an accountant or not. The answer is, you know, there's definitely should be more opportunities for people who aren't fully qualified. And then the accountant thing, interesting enough, when um, Alex probably won't like me saying this, but when we started Charter Path, we very much spoke about connecting nonprofits with accountants. And then we realized, hold on, that's quite narrow because actually there's a lot of people in different types of roles that have got really good finance exposure and the critical thing is they understand what a balance sheet is and what an income or not income statement for the charity sector. So for um, what these kind of terms are and, and, and they understand kind of how they work, which as non-financial people, we know it can be a really foreign language to just get your head around how these sort of financial statements work together. So people who are maybe trained bookkeepers, their auditors, potentially even risk professionals will all have exposure to finance skills so understanding like how the sort of income expenditure cash flow etc work together and can able to to kind of input into those areas of your organizations so definitely try to think beyond the ideal uh candidate to enlarge the pool and and create more opportunities ideally doing so where there's a support network so that again you're not putting all that responsibility on someone who's not qualified and not an accountant Brilliant, thank you. That leads us perfectly onto the next topic. It's as if you knew what was coming. Um, and I guess um, 
yeah, so we want to talk about the practicalities of finding people with financial skills. And you've just started to talk. We've talked a bit about how the name is off-putting, how people don't even know what a trustee is, let alone a treasurer. So we might be shooting ourselves in the foot there. But people also assume that you do have to be an accountant, don't they? So if you don't need an accountant, it's probably worth saying explicitly you do not have to be an accountant because otherwise people will assume that you do. So practical tips. Marie, let's start with you as a professional recruiter. What are some of your thoughts about approaching this professionally? Um, I think it's the same point to some extent I made earlier about the story of the organization first and then very specifically um, what the role is and then details of what's required in terms of time we um, I mean we search for people I guess and that a lot more than advertising because um, you know searching and looking for people not just with the right skills but maybe with the interests in in the course so it's very tailored to the particular role um, so that's really important and yeah just thinking holistically about what might interest somebody in this organization and then that they haven't the, the fact that they've got the skills that are needed is, is kind of in addition to that that's part I'll maybe add more later but that's it for now. I totally agree with that you know this is you're looking for people who are passionate about the organization and its work aren't you first and foremost and that intersect with the skills that you need at the same time yeah absolutely um Alex I'll come to you on practical tips for for where and how to find trustees with financial skills yeah so I completely agree with Marie I think the passion, number one, I think, you know, to Alice's point, being open minded about the type of, you know, individual or individuals that you're looking for, like we just see time and time again, a skew to, you know, all the same stats of sort of male 55 to 65, and sort of, you know, that sort of, you know, uh, probably overly reliant towards um, the experience end of the spectrum. And that can be, we see it with, you know, people who are looking to volunteer, often particularly younger volunteers can feel they're sort of shut out of potential opportunities. So I think addressing that up front, being clear, you know, and being realistic about the the time commitment that a volunteer can give. So whether that's 30 hours or 50 hours in a year, but being realistic. And then I think ultimately then it, it's about reach and like reaching as many people as possible and an awareness of the role. Like, again, you go through all the stats, you know, a really high proportion of trustees are typically recruited by a, sort of network of existing trustees and that's to a certain extent what has perpetuated a lot of the diversity challenges that you see uh in boards you know non-profit boards so you know we encourage people to promote wide we promote roles for example directly to our community but actually what i would encourage is to is to promote across a number of different channels and organizations i think uh, sort of i think you know particularly for smaller charities it's about reach and reaching as many people and then you know finding that person where it ticks whether it's the location, the cause, um, the level, you know, where they are in their life. You know, to Kemi's point, people at different stages of their lives have different availability. So I, I'd encourage, you know, we can share off this. There are a number of different kind of platforms that you can promote across, but I'd encourage to go across a lot. I mean, we see, I'll be honest, like when we're promoting roles, it's hard. Like we promote roles and it can typically take three to four months potentially to, you know, to fight, fill a role. So again, I think it's even going into it with a, an open mind because it can feel a bit disconcerting you decide you're going to try and recruit this role you advertise and promote it and you want it filled and you want to be deluged with applications and and you might have that in mind and then it's not happening so i think having a think up front about the channels um and covering a, a number using you know linkedin and and you're using your trustee board to promote um to try and really maximize the reach and you know give yourself choices but ultimately secure the right person I feel like that's a really important point about expectations that, you know, mm -hmm. trustee recruitment takes a lot of legwork, doesn't it? it? And takes time. If you want to reach um, a specific skill outside of the network you already have, it does take time. And I think we need to set expectations around that. Mm. Alex, you, I, I've posted a few links to some of the places you can recruit through, just because you mentioned links. Um, yes. And I, I feel like there's at least four kind of categories here, aren't there? There's, there's, if you're a larger organisation, you might use an agency like yes. Perido or one of the other ones. <laughs> there's a few. Um, you would be bonkers not to use reach volunteering, which yes, is the biggest, in, in yes. Wales, the biggest, and it's free for almost every organization, unless you're much larger, there's a small charge then. It's the biggest recruiter of trustees in England and Wales. You'd be mad not to post there. And to Alex's point about don't stop there. I'm amazed mm. how many charities say to me, oh, we posted on fill in the gap and we haven't. Well, you don't just post in one place. You need to exactly. be really 
Yeah. Then there's some specific places around fin finance volunteers, finance trustees, Charter Path being one of them. There's also the Honorary, Tre Honorary Treasurers Forum, ICAW volunteers, Accounting for International Development, all great places to advertise. But I still think that's way too narrow, isn't it? Yeah, agreed. We need to go. We These are all places where volunteers have already signed up. Yes. It's a huge plus, but it's not enough. Alex, tell me more about that. Yeah, I mean, just briefly, I mean, one of the... as using the wider network of your charity and that doesn't need to be again this this misconception this is just purely coming from like the trustees this can come through the entire you know it can come recipients of the service of your charity it can come from your team within the charity um i mean the charities i've been involved in we've done we've every kind of channel that you could imagine we've used whether it's social media channels we've made tiktok videos to promote roles um we've used traditional posters to promote roles we've covered we've used events to promote roles that can be a really good one so again where you've got a captive audience and you can talk you know to um people who are supporters of your charity you know trying to use those moments is really important so you know really sort of challenge yourself to think what are those opportunities where there is an audience who are willing to listen we've promoted roles on the radio so you know to marie's point tell the story of your charity that's the starting point the interest mm -hmm. in your charity and what you're doing then it could be a listener who's not a finance professional, but they mention it to a friend who is. So I think that, you know, really important to be, um, you know, cover all bases um, and not yeah. just be reliant on like a printed, you know, or a PDF job description that you've posted on a couple of sites. So yeah. Penny, I was just going to add to Alex's point about the kind of local posters and flyers. And one of the tips that uh, Alex and I always give finance professionals looking to volunteer is to from our personal preference find a local charity to support because it's just so great being nearby you can go in regularly you can meet people you can touch and feel it so it feels less like a kind of theoretical exercise which might be a continuation of your day job and something that you can really kind of get behind so I do really like the idea of advertising in your local community whether mm. it's flyers through the doors or posters local radio um, because that's a sort of added benefit of finding someone who's close to home mm. and I think I think your points about if you're a locally based organisation, you've probably got some really good links that can get you mm. in finance trustees. You might know, you know, I'm in Cambridge, for example. So I know people at both of the universities here. You know, there's the science parks, there's there's the hospital and the NHS trust, there's the local authority. All of those places employ loads of finance professionals. Mm. Then I might look up who the, like who's got a local accountant, local accountants and national accountants with local offices. Yes, and exactly. And actually get in and then use social media to go onto some lists where there's specifically finance professionals professionals congregating so kind of getting getting right in front of pro finance professionals where they are congregating themselves what are they reading who employs them and so on Kemi or Marie did you want to come back with any practical trustee recruitment tips Kemi let's come to you first thanks I would definitely sort of emphasize that and also say don't be afraid just again to be a bit more creative because again even if you're a small charity you are going to have a bigger network than you realize so think about who your other trustees are think about your service users can you say to them where can I go and the other aspect which I think is important is to encourage that personalized touch so certainly when I've people have approached me to ask to help with support with roles I might put it in a whatsapp group but I will say I know these people I know how they work if you want to have a conversation speak to me I know that person is willing to have a conversation I know it sounds time consuming but again back to earlier points people have such a archaic view of sort of trustee and treasurer and they want to be able to say okay what is it you want me to do and there's nothing better than having a five or ten minute conversation this is where the organization or charity or social enterprise is at this is what we need this is a context and kind of this is what we need support with so definitely sort of adding that personalized touch sort of kind of puts you above the radar as opposed to just seeing lots of roles being advertised to oh i remember this because kemi or alice or alex or penny said oh that was really good or they know somebody or they've given good feedback it stays in your head and then you're more likely to remember it and then maybe take that step forward great thank you uh, marie um, yeah, I mean, I think people have covered it, really. It's all the kind of principles of, of good marketing and uh, storytelling. But the other element, somebody put in the chat about the fact that a lot of their financial needs are fundraising related. So I was just going to add, obviously, there's the Chartered Institute of Fundraising. And we found recently uh, the person who recruits fundraisers, executive role fundraisers for our organization, put something on LinkedIn about come on fundraisers, you know, why aren't you being trustees and got loads of responses from people interested in being a, being a trustee and being on a board who are fundraising. So I think 
just being specific if, if it's fundraising skills you need just to add if you're specific about that and you go to other places like charter institute fundraising you, you know you might find that you you can also get professional fundraisers who want to be trustees if that's what you need great thank you and i loved your comment Kamala, because i think it just it just shows how we need to give it give some thought as to what we actually need rather than just shoving out an advert for a treasurer your example is a perfect illustration of actually this charity needed a fundraiser not a not a finance person at all so thank you for that let's talk a bit i mean we we've, we've kind of talked about this a bit haven't we but let's talk a bit about diversity so how do we encourage a broader set of finance professionals to become trustees um, and I'm going to kind of make you speedy because we've only got 15 minutes left and still lots to cover. So who wants to give some initial brief thoughts on that? I'll, I'll jump in really quickly then. And I think it links the storytelling point. And I think it's storytelling from diverse candidates who've been trustees, explaining to other people why it's so good, how it's benefited them, how they got involved. Because I think seeing more role models out there is helpful. At the moment, there's just a lot of terminology. There's a very kind of clear picture of the sort of average trustee, which we all know typically kind of male, two thirds white. And I think that um, being able to have um, role models that look and come from different backgrounds, think differently, would be really helpful to inspire others to get involved. Thank you. Marie? Uh, yes, I mean, yeah, I've, there's some really good sites uh, to, to diversify, to go go out to like women on boards and black on boards, there's different sites you can go to um, to advertise. And also I would say, um, you know, if you can, you can give people back their expenses, if, if people can't afford to be a trustee and they need expenses, making sure that's really clear. So, you're, you know, you people who need, you, you can't do it for free, completely need a bit of help. And also in terms of the time, if you can, you know, if people are working full time, I know I spoke to, um, a female friend who's a working mother and you know she said I can't afford to really be a trustee for a tiny charity at the moment because I'm doing it full-time in my job and I have, can't do the bookkeeping and everything so being really realistic about what so people can bring the skills and expertise but they might not have the time if they are you know working full-time and have a family so being able to be more open for those people by taking away some of the more time-consuming aspects and then being able to make the best of that person's skills so thinking of the audience really and thinking of the people that you're, you're recruiting and what their needs are. Thank you. Kemi, would you add anything to those those tips? Yeah, I'd just echo and say it's about sort of de-biasing the process as well. So similar to what Marie said, if if it looks like it's going to be a very arduous role, you're going to exclude people who have parenting or carer responsibilities who want to be involved but don't necessarily have the time. And again, it's around if the description just seems very long and wordy and doesn't necessarily capture what's needed, that can definitely put people off. And I think a bigger issue or sort of benefit going forward is also to explain the benefits to people. So even if they are working or volunteering for a short period of time, will you give them a recommendation on LinkedIn? Will you write them some, mm -hmm. a written reference? So those people without experience, they've got something, they've got a network. Will you say to them, if you need anything, I'll be able to support you so again people who don't necessarily have the experience because they can't get a role so they don't actually get any experience what can you offer those people so I think they're definitely benefits particularly in this day and age of kind of social media great thank you Alex hold that thought you've unmuted but I'm going to move us on but I just want to um signpost getting on board's free guide how to diversify your charities board because of course this is we're talking about finance trustees today but there's lots of broader kind of tips and tricks in there um, I'm going to come to Brian and Nick's questions in a minute, but let's just cover off our, four, our kind of final chunky topic, which is how do we keep finance trustees happy? Alex, are you set to, to give us some thoughts on this? How do we keep them? How do we keep you happy? Once we've bagged you, how mm. do we make you happy? I think addressing that point I said up front about avoiding the treasurer feeling sort of isolated and sort of a bit like an island. So I think for me, uh, active things I've done to help address that has been arranging training for the entire um, board of trustees on finance. There's some great free training materials out there, webinars, et cetera, that you can share or actually even watch together. Um, which I think helps because then it, it starts to drive an appreciation of what you all do. I think there is something on the, even just on the finance volunteers themselves that, that, really encouraging that treasurer or finance volunteer to speak in simple terms and to call that out. Because I think, again, but I always say it's a two-way street and often they can end up using language which is isolating or very complicated reports. I think calling out that out is important so that they, you know, they, they recognise that themselves. Um, I think the last piece, which again sounds 
a bit ridiculous. But to Kemi's point, just showing some appreciation, I think, is, and that can be done on a nice personal level. Like often just a, a, a nice thank you in between. I've got, I work as a school governor of Finance Link and the head teacher just regularly, just like, I'm always, I feel like I should be giving more thanks to this head teacher than I deserve to be getting. But it was just a nice thank you saying, I really appreciate everything you've done. Takes a second, makes a big difference. Does, thank you, Alex. Um, Alice. Yeah, I'm going to bang the drum again for making the role manageable where possible and thinking about succession planning and support. So encouraging that individual to make sure that they look at the kind of training out there, supporting them with finding the resources that they need and also encouraging them to get a support in so that they've got kind of cover and that they feel that they've got a succession plan in place rather than leaving it to the last minute. So I think the more that the rest of the board can do that, they're helping that um, finance volunteer feel supported in role. And Alice, I wonder if you could say something about support for finance volunteers, finance trustees stroke treasurers that are that's available from Charter Path and Honorary Treasurers Forum, you know, support beyond the charity that they might be able to find find there. Yeah, that's a, that's a great shout. Well, I was going to mention also, I love the sound of the infinity and beyond. So that's obviously a good one to encourage for the non-finance um, uh, volunteers. But I think um, we've got a new mentoring programme that we've just launched um, for the Charter Path and the Honorary Treasurers Forum. So if you've got maybe... Um, somebody that's come on board perhaps without a lot of charity experience you can encourage them to get involved in the mentoring program where they would have a mentor that they could go to who's got experience at, as both finance and of the non-profit sector so that they feel that they've got a sounding board for advice and support there's a brilliant whatsapp group out there that the honorary treasurers forum um, run which we love it's got loads of technical advice in there and I think people find that really beneficial. And again, it's just amazing how whatever problems come up, there's always people that have got opinions, advice, good signposting. So those are kind of two obvious resources I would point to, mentoring and the sort of WhatsApp group. And then there's a whole host of resources out there, free training um, on technical things. The ICAW hosts some great conferences once a year with technical updates, um, which are all available on, we've got a resources page for finance volunteers who are looking for support, whether it's a kind of, ongoing course or just kind of a free webinar for an hour on a particular te technical subject through the honorary treasurers forum great thank you kemi coming to you how can we keep our finance trustees happy i think a big part of it and again it sounds obvious is understanding what it is they want so um in some cases it may be the experience but you hear a lot with all sort of volunteers and trustees that they want to give back and being involved in a finance is a big part of that, but actually understanding what the organisation does. So don't be afraid to think about inviting them to an event or if you're running a food bank, asking if they want to participate or bring something with them or do they know any friends who want to. And it's not so much about getting the free volunteering, but what's more rewarding when you see that you're working for an organisation and actually this is what it all means. Like for me, working in a not-for-profit sector, as much as my achievements have been about the kind of finance side, the things that I remember are actually sort of seeing the end users and some of those conversations will stay with me forever because I've just spoken to people, met people that I would have never sort of spoken to otherwise. So don't underestimate understanding what it is your treasurer or trustee or finance volunteer wants and wants to in post. Don't be afraid to think six months down the line, actually, this is coming up. Would you want to be involved? I'll come along and take pictures or help us out. There's a lot more than people realise in terms of how you can keep people happy. Thank you, Kemi. That's a, such a good re reminder. And Kemi, can I just come back to you with a slightly different question? Have you seen working as a, a finance, finance person in charities and being a treasurer yourself, have you seen a kind of mismatch in expectations between, you know, a treasurer is recruited and they think they're coming on to do job A, but when they get there, they're actually doing B and probably C and D and E and F as well. So is there some unhappiness about, you think you're coming in to do a certain lot of tasks and actually you get there and, and the people that recruited you think you're there to do something else? Yes, completely. I think for a lot of my friends, like we always say that wherever you see a role advertised, just double the amount of hours because it's just never sort of been realistic. But it is a big issue and it does put people off or it 
if it doesn't put them off, it actually puts them on more pressure because we know our responsibilities in the finance world. And if you're working for a charity, you want to do good for them. So it then almost becomes a bit stress inducing because you suddenly realise you've got all of these things to do. Then you see there's more things you could do on top of the things that you need to do. And then suddenly you're just like completely overwhelmed. So again, it goes back to that point that Alice raised, like think about what is it you need and don't be afraid to ask that ask for that but definitely sort of break it down into chunks so you might need three different types of people at three different stages and that's absolutely fine thank you uh, marie final thoughts on keeping trust uh, finance finance trustees happy yeah i think it's just the connection isn't it so you've been attracted to the cause to start with and like kemi said staying close to that cause that connection and even you know even the staff as well we need to do don't we in an organization is connected to the mission the vision why you're there and also i think it's relationships and people you don't want to feel isolated as the as the loan finance person and basically as we started off saying so you want to be connected into whether it's subcommittee whether it's with another volunteer you don't want to be just left to it you know you're there for relationships and for learning as well as giving aren't you so it has to be two-way and connection really thank you Definitely, you don't want to feel like you're out on a limb, and particularly if you if you've got all that stress that Kemi's talking about about the, the kind of risks that you're holding. Okay, so let's come on to some audience questions. There's, I can see too. If anybody else has got any final burning question, you need to ask it within the next twenty seconds because um, I need to pass over to Fiona with two or three minutes to spare. Um, so Nick Sutter asked a question, can, can you signpost some trusty forums on LinkedIn? So I just want to give a bit of a precursor to this, because I think, you know, there are some trusty forums on LinkedIn. There's quite a big one. It's called something like UK Charity Trustees. I think it's, it's got several tens of thousands of people in it. But actually, is that the right place to be recruiting finance trustees? Yes, it probably is one of the places you could recruit them. I think you could go into LinkedIn and go into the group section and put in almost any professional skill. So whether you put in finance or accounting or bookkeeping, it will bring groups up. And I almost went to get a link and then I thought, actually, no, because I know it's true because I do it for trustee recruitment all the time. You could also do it for safeguarding and fundraising and marketing and so on. Um, does anybody want to add anything to the about the use of LinkedIn for trustee recruitment? Marie, maybe you. I think, you know, LinkedIn can be brilliant, but you need to take time and be quite tailored in your approach. I think, you you, you know, you get, get more back and better back when you do that than to blanket a vague you know avoid vagueness and two blanket uh a push try and be tailored and specific and uh and you might you might have some good value there i think that's a good mantra for trustee recruitment in general isn't it to try, try and be quite specific and then there's a question from brian and maybe kemi i could come to you so brian's just asking for advice on tools um I guess, could the answer be rather than listing out some different kind of bits of software, where could he go for advice on this? Where, where's, where's a good place for finance advice, for your charity finance advice? Um, well, I'd say sort of in particular, I think, again, it goes back to what you want, because there will be some finance professionals who have experience or have experienced a particular accounting system and may not be using it now but would be keen to support. So I think it is good in that sense. But again, it goes back to not necessarily saying, I'm not saying that Brian was going to do this, needs, I just need sage experience because that doesn't necessarily sort of capture what's needed. So I think again, sort of there's a kind of wider kind of in, to ensure that what what is it you're exactly asking for? Is it a systems review in general or is it somebody who needs to have understanding of a particular system? Um, in terms of support, um, again, I think for me, it, it goes back to sort of being tapped into some of those community groups as well. Again, in terms of identifying what it is you need, and it might not necessarily be a trustee. It might be I need a finance volunteer just to help me on this specific software or I'm looking to review systems. So therefore, the SAGE isn't a necessity. So again, in terms of being more specific about what it is you're looking for is really helpful. Just one Thank brief you. part to add to that, Penny, just really briefly. You've got covered. five seconds, yeah. Alex. It just really, to, for the charities on here, I'd really encourage them to think about um, promoting project roles where they need a project volunteer. To Kemi's point, I think often their accountants have busy times and quiet times, and often they're put off by this thought that they need to do this every single month. So I think often where it's quite specific thing that you need help with, advertise a specific project role where you need support. Thank you, Alex. Oh, and sorry, Brian, I did misread your question, but luckily Kemi had read it correctly. <laughs> both yours and mine. So sorry that we're slightly overrunning, but thank you, panel. I thought that was an absolutely fascinating hour. Hopefully we've given lots of food for thought and tips and tricks to the people that have attended. And Fiona, I'm going to pass back to you to close us off. 
Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Penny, um, for bringing a brilliant host then. Thank you, Alice, Kemi, Alex and Marie for just being fantastic panellists. I've got pages of notes. Um, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, please fill in our evaluation form. Um, I posted that into the chat. Final thank you to our sponsors, Charisma, Diversifying Group, Perido, Starfish and TPP. Um, if you're able to make a donation, please do. This helps us to keep the programme free. And um, I'm just going to quickly cover off what else Getting On Board can um, help you with. I'm just going to very quickly uh, share a slide. I hope you can see that. Um, brief pause, well, hopefully it will show, possibly not. I'll just whistle through it anyway. Um, so please check out our upcoming free trustee learning program sessions, um, download our free guides and resources. I put some of those into the chat earlier, actually, um, and book your weekly pass very, very early to our Festival of Trusteeship, which is happening 4th to 8th of November 2024. You'll be very glad you did because you'll get the early bird price. Um, visit our website to uh, read more about the bespoke and intensive support we can provide. Sign up to our newsletter. Um, and that is everything. Just once again, thank you very much for being a fantastic, uh, very, very engaged audience. Lots of amazing questions in there. Um, it's been a really, really wonderful hour. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.